Well, without further ado, Brian, thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Well, hi, everybody. I'm going to talk generally about the documents that we do primarily in the office for, for most people that most seniors need um, without regard to COVID. And, and then um, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the changes in both our procedures and, and legislatively that have happened that makes our, our doing our job easier. The governor has made some significant changes out about the, the methods and techniques such as notary public requirements and witnessing requirements. So we'll get into that as well. And as Ann said, as, as we're going, if you have a question, you could chat it into her or chat it to everybody by clicking the, uh, depending on what type of computer you're on, there's a chat button and she'll either restate your question to me. And like, for example, I don't know if everyone sees Fernando just said, thank you everybody for participating. And um, if you click the chat, you should be able to see that and you could respond and thank him for putting this together as well as in. So on, on this call or on the Zoom, if you will, with me, we have some people from my office. We have Samantha Benediba, who I'm seeing on my screen. She's one of our drafting attorneys who handles estates and drafting and complex uh, planning matters. We have uh, Matthew Rafan, who's also one of our attorneys who's lectured at Penn South a few times before. Matthew does drafting, he handles uh, estate work, he makes the rounds in Penn South often as well, just to, to visit, check in on people and whatever the case may be. We have m my brother, Neil, who is essential support for our office in technology, advertising, marketing, and helping the world and so forth. So anyway, the first thing I'm gonna talk to you about is a, a power of attorney. Now that we're home and everybody's sort of freaked out, uh, we're getting a lot of calls from people about how they should be able to manage their affairs or the affairs of their loved ones. Uh, we have people whose spouses, partners, or family members are in the hospital or in quarantine and can't do certain things that they used to do for themselves before. And so the key document in our practice that helps one person manage the affairs of another person is a general durable power of attorney. Power of attorneys have been around for forever. It allows you to basically execute a document where you designate somebody else to handle your business and or financial pers and personal affairs. So for example, if you're incapacitated or incommunicado, and you want someone to go to the bank for you because you, can't, you don't wanna leave the apartment, understandably, and go to the bank. Well, if you give your power of attorney to your son, daughter, spouse, or trusted friend, that power of attorney, who's the person's called an agent, technically, that agent can go to the bank for you, access your bank account, withdraw money from your bank account, and then bring it back to you at your house um, for your own use. Um, that agent could have check writing authority for you. If, you've, um, if, if you're done paying your bills, it's too much work, um, and you don't wanna handle that anymore, you can designate a power of attorney to do that for you. Uh, tax times around the corner, everybody should know that tax time's been extended, and I'm gonna make a note, and we'll talk about that as well later. You, you your power of attorney agent can help get your tax returns done, can deal with your CPA, could deal with the IRS and, and, and anyone else that needs dealing with. So essentially, um, there are various types of power of attorney documents. There are um, a, a general power of attorney. The minute you execute that document, it's valid. Once you sign it and it gets notarized, it, you've designated somebody. If your agent has the document, they can act on your behalf. Um, it, it, if you become incapacitated with a regular general power of attorney, that agent no longer has the authority to act for you. Their power terminates when your capacity terminates. We do not use that power of attorney in our office, in our practice, um, because generally we are planning for incapacity. We're planning for when our clients can't handle things for themselves. That's when we need the team to step up and, and your power of attorney agent being a critical part of that team. So, 
essentially what we use is what's called a general durable power of attorney. If you have a durable power of attorney, when you become incapacitated, your agent can continue to act on your behalf. That's the critical time when you want the agent to act on your behalf. When pointing, appointing an agent, you need to pick the person carefully. You don't want to pick a person who's stolen money from you before, who maybe is a felon, who maybe you met last week, because if you give the wrong person a power of attorney, they can go to your bank and they can withdraw your account and they can get on a plane, maybe not now, but they can get on a plane and move to Peru and take your millions of dollars and steal it. When you give someone a power of attorney, you're giving them access to your financial and business and personal life. You're not giving them the legal ability to steal your money. The law is that they have to act in your best interest. But if you pick the wrong person, they may not be acting in your best interest. So pick someone that you've known for a long time. Pick someone that you trust. Pick someone that can carry out the duties that you're going to give them to do. Don't pick your sister or brother who's 92 living either at home or uh, you know, perhaps in a nursing home or perhaps in Ohio because he or she may be dealing with significant issues of their own and may not have the time, capacity, or desire, or, or just general ability to handle your affairs. So more important than having a power of attorney is having the right agent as a power of attorney. You could always get someone to be your agent, but if they can't manage their own life, they're not gonna manage your life. So there, there's an additional type of power of attorney. If, you, if you're not 100% sure of the agent and you don't want them to get immediate power because you're still fine now, you, you know, you're handling everything yourself, there's no need for it now, you want to put this in place for a, a catastrophic event in the future, you can execute what's called a springing power of attorney. A springing power of attorney is a power of attorney document that just simply takes effect at some future time upon the happening of some future event. So you could execute a power of attorney that says, it's only good every Tuesday, or you could execute a power of attorney that says, if my doctor says that I'm incapacitated, then my agent can pay my bills, then my agent can do my banking, then my agent can handle my affairs. Incidentally, a power of attorney is not only about money, it's about management. So uh, we act as power of attorney for many people, we take care of their day-to-day -day affairs, we hire their caretakers, uh, we fire their caretakers if necessary. We make decisions about vacations, we make decisions about extracurricular activities, we make decisions about, you know, can we get them to go to the opera? Can we get them to go to Lincoln Center? You know, when you're allowed to do those things in the old world anyway. It goes beyond simple check writing privileges. To execute a power of attorney, you just simply sign it, date it in front of a notary public, and the document is valid. The agent has to sign the power of attorney document before they start to use it. They don't have to sign it when you sign it because you may appoint someone power of attorney and it may never be needed. They just have to sign it at some time before they're gonna use it. So if they're going to go to the bank, they could sign it at that time. They sign it before a notary public and it's as simple as that. Sometimes banks give people a hard time with the power of attorney document. They may say, wait, this is not our form. We never saw this before. We have to check it out. Well, you know, the, the form that we generally use literally is a form. It, 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 the form itself is printed in the statutes or the laws of the state of New York. We have some modifications to it to make it a little more usable. Essentially, the form that we will circulate, and if anyone needs help, we, we, we can email circulate this to you to approve review, is an acceptable required form in New York State. If you appoint someone as your power of attorney agent and you change your mind, you can revoke that power of attorney. To revoke that power of attorney designation, you simply have to execute a revocation of power of attorney. It's a one-page document. It says, I hereby revoke my power of attorney. It gets notarized after you sign it. And you, of course, need to notify your agent that he or she has been terminated um, and it's also good to let your banks know that you've terminated that power of attorney designation. Um, I see we have some questions. Yeah, um, so just to read the questions out. So as a relation to who you should choose as a power of attorney, Marjorie is asking, so are you saying I should not have my son in California be power of attorney? 
Well, no, it, that's certainly a fine idea. It, it, you know, you have to weigh the ability of the person to act. You know, by virtue of what we're doing right now in Zoom, you don't have to be in New York necessarily. Um, we sometimes have agents who live in California and what they do is first of all, they have all these technologies to help them be local. They could Zoom with you, they could FaceTime with you, they can call you. They probably would find a local liaison in town um, to handle day-to-day -day affairs, um, you know, to maybe physically check in with you. I would not bar your son or rule out your son as long as you think they'll have the ability to handle it. Now, when it comes time for your son or any uh, designee who's not in New York to act as your agent, they probably will have to come to New York to visit your bank to record the power of attorney. That's a one-time event. They'll come to the bank, the bank may say, I have to send this document to legal department to get it approved, come back in two days, but presumably and hopefully they're coming in longer than one or two days. So um, I think your son is a good choice. What you, you could also do, which I neglected to mention with a power of attorney, you could have multiple agents. You could have your son, your daughter, your rabbi and your priest, and you could require that any one of the four of them could act. Um, you could also require that all four of them are, re uh, are required to act together. That's a little burdensome because then you'll have to, all four of them would have to be at the bank at the same time. We don't recommend that. So you could appoint multiple simultaneous agents. So if your agent who's in California can't get to New York to record with the bank, maybe your agent who's in New York can get to uh, your bank to record. You can also appoint a primary agent and a successor agent. So if your primary agent, let's say you appoint uh, your brother and your brother's unwell or your spouse and, and he or she is unwell, you're, you can have a successor agent who may not be the best choice, but it's a, a good second choice. So that's a great question, but you know, I would say it's a case by case analysis. You have to look at the, the um, wherewithal of your agent to determine if it's a good choice. Brian, there's another question regarding POA. Does a POA designation supersede spouse or other family member? Well, it does in some ways and it does in not in other ways. A POA can't cook or clean or take care of you, um, but it, 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 it certainly doesn't. Um, it, it's a confusing question because they really have nothing to do with each other. Just because you have a spouse, doesn't mean your spouse has the ability to access your bank account if your spouse's name is not on that bank account. So um, if you have a bank account in your own name and you're using that to pay all your household bills and your spouse is not on that account and you become incapacitated, those monies are frozen up. Your spouse can't go to the bank and you know sign checks for you. I know in the real world, a lot of times spouses sign checks for each other but that's not technically correct. If this bank knew that, they wouldn't allow those checks to go through. The POA gives the authority that's in the document. It doesn't supersede a spouse. A spouse is always a spouse, but a spouse doesn't have rights to access your finances. So if, I hope that helps. And one more question. Can you appoint specific people to handle specific things? That's a good question. Um, I've been practice, practicing about 30 years and, and no one's ever presented that question. I like it. Um, the answer is yes. When you um, execute a power of attorney, you have a number of statutory powers you could grant. For example, if you were buying a house and um, you wanted to go on vacation and you could not be at the closing, you could appoint me as your agent simply to consummate the real estate transaction. You could appoint me as your agent um, to consummate the real estate tra transaction only for one specific property. You could make that power of attorney expire in two weeks. You could put a, a termination date on it. You can condition it any way you want. And you could also, by statute, expand powers as broad as you want. So yes, you can name specific agents for specific people. Generally, if you're, if you're naming a trusted loved one as your agent, spouse, you know, um, 
child, brother, sister, you know, someone you really trust, there's no question. It's best to give them as broad powers as possible because remember, we're planning for catastrophe and incapacity and we're seeing it play out in real time here now. Our phone is ringing off the hook with people who can't access the affairs of their loved ones. Why restrict the person if you trust them, know them and love them? If you don't have a power of attorney, and you're locked out of, uh, of some, or let's say other people can't access your affairs, you're incapacitated, you're in the hospital, God forbid, on a respirator, and we need access to your money to pay bills, to pay for your care, to pay for your home care, to keep you in comfort, and we don't have a power of attorney. Well, the only way we get access to your fa affairs is through the court. And when I, you know, Supreme Court of New York County, we've all seen the beautiful building in person and on TV at 60 Center Street. We would have to have a court proceeding in front of a judge about your capacity or about your incapacity. You will be the center stage, and maybe not you because you may not be aware of what's going on, but your personal, intimate, and financial affairs will be the subject of everybody's knowledge downtown. Those are not confidential proceedings, they're public proceedings. The court files in New York County are not sealed. We will be talking about you. Your doctors will be talking about you. Your assets will become of record. The judge will appoint a number of people to get involved with your affairs. And inevitably, a judge will select who handles your affairs. I'll talk more about that later. But those are called guardianship proceedings. Why somebody would want to trust um, a stranger, a judge, to appoint someone to take care of their affairs and in incapacity versus them making that judgment would, is bizarre to me. People think that, oh, it's never gonna happen to me. I think now, because I see what the calls that are coming in, those thoughts are done. People know it could happen to them. So now everybody all of a sudden is waking up and wants to plan. Okay, great. I think you can move on. Those are all the power of attorney questions. Uh, the, the companion document, power of attorney being of a financial nature, I imagine most of you are familiar with what a healthcare proxy is. A healthcare proxy is the healthcare counterpart to a power of attorney. You could appoint somebody to make a medical decision for you if you can't make the decision yourself. If the doctors declare that you are incapacitated um, and you can't make a decision, they need to turn to somebody. Now, um, you know, spouse does have rights here, but uh, even if a spouse has rights here, sometimes a spouse doesn't have capacity and sometimes a spouse will inevitably not be there and um, we need someone to make medical decisions. Not only medical decisions, um, care related decisions, home care involved, um, you know, uh, life sustaining treatment, should we put the person on a respirator we had a case recently um, in the midst of COVID where we had a 94 year old. We had two people, two friends, one was 94 and one was 92 and they both got COVID. The 94 year old was fine and has now gone home. The 92 year old was on a respirator for three weeks, which is sort of unheard of for a younger person. But um, it, you know, she expired after three weeks when a decision was made to take the respirator off. Um, there are some different laws going on now with respect to removal of life-sustaining treatment, but a healthcare proxy makes clear who you want involved if it comes time to make either a critical medical decision or even a non-critical medical decision. You could be at the dentist and the dentist may say, I, I need to pull this wisdom tooth um, and, and your healthcare proxy agent can make that decision. The healthcare proxy agent can authorize prescriptions for, you know, drugs that can keep people less agitated. Um, you know, if you're in a hospital, the doctors are really just treating the physical symptoms often. So it's nice to know that my agent is going to take care of my mental well-being and keep me as mentally comfortable as possible, as opposed to a doctor who's just going to keep my heart beating and, and, and um, you know, sustaining my life. So a healthcare proxy agent could be anybody. Um, you only can appoint one agent at a time, unlike a power of attorney where you could have simultaneous agents. You can't do that with a health proxy. The doctors don't want two people arguing or fighting in front of them. 
about a he said, she said, you could appoint one person. If that person's not available or steps aside, you could have a successor. You could line up as many people as you want um, as your healthcare proxy agents. It's a simple document. You can get them at the senior center. You can get some of them online. You know, I'm not, ours is no better per se than other documents that are around, um, but you should execute one under the old pre-COVID rules. You sign the document in front of two witnesses. Your agent can't be a witness. Your agent has to just be an adult who's competent, essentially. And then your document is valid. Once you execute it, you should give a copy to your agent. You should give a copy to your doctor so they know who to call if you become incapacitated. Um, you should let your Yenta neighbors know who your healthcare proxy agent is. So if EMS shows up at your door one day and, and, and your neighbor, of course, who's in the hall and knows everything anyway, sees this going on, they could say, oh, call Joan, she knows, you know, or she call Joan. You know, you don't want to end up in the hospital where no one in your, in your circle knows you're there for a week because, you know, that's just not a scenario we like to hear about. So um, healthcare proxy, critical at this time for everybody. I, I see some questions coming in uh, if, you, if you wanna read those. Yeah. So should you bring a copy to the hospital? Well, um, yeah, that's great if you have the wherewithal and foresight to bring a copy to the hospital, depending how you're getting to the hospital. Unfortunately, these days or any days, you know, if, if we believed on mortality and we planned, it would be a lot easier. But um, unfortunately, we don't always have the presence of mind to pack for the hospital. So um, what we tell many of our, we tell our clients is, um, and we give many of our clients on, you know, when EMS comes to your house, if there's no family around and the ambulance reports to your house or the police reports to your house because of some condition, they often, they used to look by the phone, but many people don't have a phone anymore, but they typically look on the refrigerator for important numbers to call, emergency contacts. So you could put a copy of it on your refrigerator with an envelope in it. You could put emergency contact numbers by your refrigerator. Yes, you should put a, uh, bring a copy to the hospital if you can. We also, when we do advanced directives, these are generally power of attorney healthcare proxy. These are called advanced directives. We give out these little laminated wallet cards for people. Um, like a miniature healthcare proxy. It just tells EMS will find you, God forbid, in the street. They'll go through your wallet. They'll find this card and they'll say, oh, call so-and-so. You know, the key is we don't want you in the hospital alone. Now with COVID, you're sort of unfortunately in the hospital alone. This, you know, we've had some client catastrophes and not only are, are, are the, is the hospital visit often alone, the, the funerals are often alone, which is sort of sad. But, um, you know, um, so yes, bring it to the hospital. Um, any other questions? Nope, on? nope, related, not related to that. Oh, actually, yes, I'm sorry. Can you put a digital copy on your phone? Well, you could, and it's a good idea. You know, we could uh, PDF you any documents we, or, or scan you any documents that you have. If it's a photograph, it's going to be tough for any medical professional to review, but I carry on my phone complete access, uh, you know, uh, to our entire office records of executed documents. So, you know, every other day we're getting an email, hey, I need a copy of my healthcare proxy. So wherever I am, I can grab a copy via email and email it to the client. So you should scan or fax a copy to yourself, keep it in a PDF format. So then you could email it to the doctor or a nurse as opposed to sending a photograph. Um, you know, so yes, that works. And in relation to the card that you mentioned, the question, Brian, is how do you get that card? Well, when we're back in the office, if, if you have a healthcare proxy and you want to email it to us, um, we can generate a card for you and, and we would mail it to you. You can pick it up. We'll make you pick it up because this way you get out of the house. So if you, if you want, at, at no cost, you email us your existing healthcare proxy we can create a laminated card for you um, uh, that you can carry around in your wallet. I will add, you know, following up on one of these questions, photocopies of healthcare proxies are fine and acceptable. The doctors, the medical profession, that world wants to make it easy for medical decision making. So, um, 
any other healthcare proxy questions before I talk about living will? Okay. Nope. So a living will, uh, again, most people probably know what it is. It's also a medical document. It does not appoint anybody. It's a simple document that says the type of treatment you want at the end of your life. Uh, when you have, you know, if you have a terminal condition, no hope of recovery, permanently unconscious, or irreversible brain damage, um, if you stop breathing, if you die, should we bring you back? Should we resuscitate you if you're in that condition? It's, it's, um, you know, it's not, I'm going to the doctor, should I do a surgery or not? It's, it's should we keep you alive or not? And, and, and the truth is, is your healthcare proxy agent can make those decisions. But the value of a living will is, is immeasurable, and we hear it all the time. Um, it, you know, it's tough as a healthcare proxy to say, don't resuscitate or remove that ventilator. But if a person has a living will, it, it sort of relieves the guilt of your healthcare proxy agent. And it really, you know, puts down your exact wishes in black and white in writing. So, um, you know, you're not appointing anyone. It's just a statement of, of your intent, desires. Do you want to be resuscitated? Do you not want to be resuscitated? One of my, my, my favorite stories is I had a husband and wife in the office. And of course, she wanted a living will. But likewise, she did not want her husband to have a living will because he had a big pension and she didn't want his pension to stop. So, and she wanted his benefits to continue. So, of course, he agreed. Um, so you know, a living will is an important document to have. It's executed just like a healthcare proxy, signed by you in the presence of two witnesses. And, um, you know, it should be circulated, it should be shared. If, um, you know, you, if, if you're at, um, at home and you stop breathing and EMS shows up at the premises, they will resuscitate you. That, that's their job. They're going to take all um, reasonable action to keep you alive or, or, or bring you back to be alive, um, even if you don't want that to be the case. If, if, if you're in a coma and you stop breathing, they will bring you back because that's what they're supposed to do. But if you have a living will, you know, they wouldn't do that. The, the um, last medical related document I'm gonna touch on is called a MOLST, M-O-L-S-T. It's a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. It's essentially a DNR, do not resuscitate, or DNI, do not intubate. That's where they put a breathing tube through your neck. It's signed by a doctor it's, or signed by a nurse practitioner. It gives specific medical um, treatments for specific circumstances. So if you want to have that, you should talk to your doctor about it. I'm going to, the last advanced directive is a prepayment for burial. If you're alone and you have no one, you know, no family members, who's gonna arrange for your burial? Maybe your executor will. Uh, if you have an executor that's named in a will, we'll talk about that in a moment. You're, you, you have the right to go to a funeral home now and make a deposit with them for what plans you want in the future. If you don't do that and you're alone, someone is gonna to have to make those decisions for you. We often do that, but we don't love to do it. We do as best we can. If there was a predeceased spouse or other family member, we try to use the same cemetery or we try to use the same type of services. Do you want it to be religious? Do you not want it to be religious? So you can go to a, a funeral home, deposit a couple of dollars with them, when I say a couple of dollars, cremation could cost anywhere from $1,500 to at, at the place on Madison Avenue, maybe $10,000 or $20,000. So make the decision about on your own. Um, I see a question coming in about donating uh, your body. You could certainly donate your body. NYU has a, uh, has a body donation program or a brain donation program. You're welcome to do that. It's a, it's a good idea. It helps people. If you do that, you need to let the people in your life know that that's what you want because you want to make sure that your body's donated before it's buried or cremated. Would it be helpful to put all of these documents into an envelope marked for EMS and put it inside the door as a way to uh, identify or help EMS identify that these documents exist? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, you could tape it onto your refrigerator. 
you could tape it on the inside of the door. You know, if you have home care in the house, they should know where these important documents are. They should, you know, know who to tell EMS to call. No question about that. Mm -hmm. And the other question is that, is there a centralized registry for these documents um, that, you know, medical professionals would have access to? I'm told that there is such a, uh, a, a registry, but we don't, we haven't used it. I'm not sure EMS is using them. I am told that something such as, it's something like that exists. Okay. Sorry, I don't have more information on it. Got it. And those are... Pretty much the questions there so you can continue yeah okay i just want to briefly talk about what happens if you don't do those uh, advanced directives that we discussed and i touched upon it it's called a guardianship proceeding the way guardianship proceedings happen is some caring person in your family or maybe a social worker who sees uh, you're alone no one has access to make your medical decisions no one has access to make your business decisions no one has access to pay your bills. You know, we want to keep you home. Our, our goal is generally to keep you home. No one has access, you know, to do anything for you because you're incapacitated. So if, if that exists, um, we need to commence a guardianship proceeding. The way that happens is we, we write up a little book report on you. Uh, we explain to the judge or the court the situation, what's involved what's going on, what you can't do, what you can do, and we submit this book report to the, to the court. The court reviews it. The court then appoints a lawyer for you, who's getting paid, by the way, from your money, whether you like it or not. The court also then appoints an investigator um, to investigate everything that's in this book report about you. It's called the court evaluator. And um, the, these people get access to your banks, to your personal affairs, to your family affairs, to your apartment, to you. Um, and inevitably, the judge will schedule a hearing. Um, and at that hearing, everybody will be there talking about you. Um, even if you have a child, it doesn't mean that child, as I said, has access to your bank account to pay your bills. It, you know, you may have a power of attorney. That power of attorney may be incapacitated or incompetent and can't act. So we need to take some action so you know at this hearing the problem is is that at the end of the hearing i should say if you're incapacitated the, the judge is going to pick a person to be your guardian the judge doesn't always appoint family particularly if there's a lot of money involved or there's dissension in the family if you have two kids and they're not talking to each other um, the judge is not going to necessarily appoint one because the, there may be fear that the other will be excluded. So the judge could appoint a stranger who are generally um, lawyers, accountants, sometimes social workers from a list. Um, there are good people on the list and there are bad people on the list. I happen to audit guardians for the court to make sure they stay kosher and, and honest. And I've had cases where we found substantial theft. I've had two guardians put in jail or, or been involved. I didn't, I didn't prosecute them, but you know, our information went to the appropriate um, people and, and that they've been put in jail for taking advantage of their, their, their uh, position as guardian. They've stolen money. Um, but worse, um, you know, th th they make bad decisions. Like it's really easy to manage someone when they're in a nursing home. You don't have to do anything. You, you know, you get a phone call, okay, you hang up and it's all, but it's more difficult to keep someone at home. You want that person to manage you who's gonna keep you at home. Um, I mean, unless you wanna to go to a nursing home, but, but um, you know, it's not easy keeping someone at home that's incapacitated. We have situations now where we've had to revamp all of our home care arrangements because we don't want different home care workers coming in and out because they could bring in the virus. So we've restructured the pay, payroll for our home care people. We've restructured their, their work days. Um, I have a client who's tested positive, so we had to get the home care worker to agree to stay with her. So the home care worker is quarantined with her for two weeks. You know, there, there are labor law issues, there are all types of issues. So 
If the point is, is you want to pick your team. You don't want to just rely upon the judge to pick someone. Don't think that just because the judge is going to pick a lawyer, that a lawyer knows what they're doing. I, you know, I'm not talking against the profession, but there are people that don't know what they're doing. Or, and again, like I said, it, it may not be a lawyer who's appointed and it may be a social worker, which oftentimes could be better, but social workers may not have the wherewithal on the financial side. So um, pick your own people, stay out of the court if you don't need to. A court guardianship proceeding out of your money could cost anywhere from $5,000 to $25,000, which is also another good reason um, why you should just do a, a healthcare proxy for free at the senior center or a power of attorney for a few hundred dollars uh, in our office or any other lawyer's office. Last uh, document, the obvious uh, is, a, is a will. Everyone knows what a will is. It allows you to pick the individuals who are going to inherit from you when you're um, gone, dead. You can give out bequests of money to people. You can give out your tchotchkes to people. You cannot give your apartment to anybody. You live in mutual redevelopment. It's a limited equity co-op. It goes back to the cooperative corporation. When you die after they do some restoration to the apartment, your estate will get equity back. You will not get every dollar you put in out because they charge the restoration fees against your equity. You could leave bequests of the equity. Many people leave the equity to charities um, or you know, to family members. You know, whatever you want to do, you can do. A will in general to be executed has to be signed by you and witnessed by two individuals who are not beneficiaries in the will, who are over the age of 18, who are competent. When we do wills, we execute them typically in the office. We have witnesses that are professionals in our office. We know that they're credible. Our job is to make sure your will is sustainable, that the court doesn't have any problems with it, that no one objects to it, that it's acceptable and it goes through smoothly. When a, a lawyer files a will with the court, there's a presumption of accuracy and regularity. Um, so the goal is to, to get it done right in accordance with ordinary procedures. You could change your will at any time as long as you're competent. So if you do a will now and you give $5,000 to your neighbor, Sadie, and you no longer um, want to leave anything to Sadie, you can revise your will and just do a new will or you can do what's called a codicil, which is an amendment to a will. We don't use codicils as much anymore because now everything is in word processing. If you want to make a change, it's sort of pretty easy to make a change to a will. Um, wills, if you have a disabled child, spouse, or beneficiary, it's important to have a will. If you have no will and everything goes to your disabled spouse, that money may end up going to Medicaid if Medicaid is inevitably in the picture, and I'll talk about Medicaid in a, in a minute. So for example, you could leave uh, $100,000 to your daughter, but it's in trust for your daughter. So um, the, she won't have direct access to those funds. You could appoint someone to manage the money for your daughter and strip the money or pay the money out to her a little at a time as she needs it to pay the bills for her, to help her with things, and, and even to keep that child on public benefits. Um, if you don't have a will, when you die, the laws of the state of New York will determine who inherits from you. So um, if you have children who you um, don't appreciate for whatever reason, good or bad, that's your right. You're, um, they can inherit from you. If, if you don't have a children or spouse and you maybe just have a brother and sister and you haven't talked to your brother in 25 years, if you die without a will, like it or not, that brother is going to inherit from you. And if that brother dies before you, his children may inherit from you, which may not really uh, you know, be ideal with your wishes. If you have no close family um, and you die without a will or no one who steps up, uh, the public administrator of the state of New York can step up and probably will step up and manage your estate. They will come in your apartment. They will change the locks in your apartment. They will go through your intimate and personal family um, heirlooms, family effect, uh, personal effects. Um, you know, in, in a perfect world, they're supposed to try to sell everything in your apartment to, to, to um, create the cash into your estate. Things often get thrown out. That doesn't often happen. 
Um, so, uh, you know, not having a will, you're risking losing track of these family heirlooms. We always get, or, uh, not always, we often get calls about, you know, um, family photographs. If you, if you have no will and the public administrator gets appointed, those are likely going to get thrown out because they have no monetary value. They're after monetary value. If you do a will, you get the right to choose an executor. An executor is like a power of attorney after your death. Who's going to wrap up your affairs? You know what it's like managing your life for you at first hand in your lifetime. Um, so you need to choose the right person as your executor who's going to do it when you're deceased. Your executor has to collect all your assets, pay all, your, pay all of your bills, and um, pay your taxes and inevitably distribute your estate. Some people are inherently slow. Some people are inherently incapable. Um, so it, it's, it's often easy to say my spouse is going to do it, but sometimes the spouse isn't managing the stuff in the household now. So it's not necessarily a great decision. Um, you know, you can appoint your child in California. That's a fine decision as long as your child in California is capable of coming into New York, visiting the apartment, taking the time that you feel is necessary um, to go through the apartment, uh, you know, and, and deal with the personal effects and move things forward. You know, I had a case once where one of our clients appointed her 90 year old boyfriend as the executor. I mean, it was just a little crazy because it, it took us about four years to wrap up the estate and it would have taken our office probably six months to a year maximum to wrap up the estate. You know, your beneficiaries are out there that they're, they're waiting for their bequests. They want to get closure in their mind. It's dragging it out. So pick a right executor. You could pick anybody as your executor. They just have to be a U.S. citizen or a resident green card holder. You could pick family, friends, lawyer, accountant. Whoever you pick is entitled to a statutory commission or fee for doing it. So just pick the right person um, as your executor. Um, I see some questions. Yeah. So Brian, a lot of questions about whether people can do this on their own. Is there a website that has a template that could be used or can they simply write out a simple will and have it, you know, signed, witnessed, and dated? Also, if they do that, where should these be, these wills be kept, be filed? Um, if you can talk about that. Yeah. Well, first, you're lucky enough to live at Mutual Redevelopment over there and, and, and the management office knows everything about everybody. So they maintain this list of emergency contacts. I urge you all to update that list of emergency contacts because if something happens to you in the apartment, EMS or, or, or worse, um, management can get called and they can notify the appropriate emergency contact. And that emer one of those emergency contacts could be your executor. So, um, you know, that's important. Can you do it on your own? Yes. I, I think everything that we do on our office is simple and everyone could do on their own. Should you do it on your own? Probably not. Um, you know, we've had cases where people, uh, it's, you know, penny wise, dollar foolish. A will, to put this in perspective, could be anywhere from, you know, $400 to uh, $1,500, depending on how complicated you want and uh, want it to be and depending on what your planning is. So is it, does it really make sense to do it on your own? I don't know. You know, you make a, a mistake in wording uh, or you make a mistake in the, in the execution of the will and your whole plan could potentially go out the window. We have a will in our office that we're probating now where the client did it on her own. She gave out her entire estate in paragraph three. And then in paragraph four, she gave out the entire contents to her apartment. But that is wrong. You can't do that because it's read in succession. So in paragraph three, she gave out her entire estate, which includes the contents of the apartment. And in paragraph four, she gave out the contents of the apartment, but they're gone because they were given out in paragraph three. So we have an unhappy person in paragraph four, and we have a, a happy person in paragraph three. The wording is very particular and it's very specific. This is, this is you know important stuff. This is everything that you've accumulated in your lifetime until now. So I, I'm going to venture to say, um, don't do it on your own. Of course, if you have a question, we're happy to talk to you and, and on the phone for free or a 15 minute Zoom, I guess. We're happy to give to all, all of the membership on a accommodation to Ann. Um, and, and we could talk about how to schedule those. 
but I'm not, I'm just not sure it's the, it's the greatest idea to do it on your own. To execute a will, you have to sign it in the presence of two witnesses. This is pre COVID. We're going to talk about this in a minute, big changes. So you have to sign in the presence of two witnesses. Those witnesses cannot be beneficiaries and cannot be um, interested in the estate. We had a case where a person did a, a will and she had one of the beneficiaries as a witness. Well, you know, that will has a lot of problems, um, you know, like when that happens. Um, the will has to be stapled when you signed it because otherwise there's a presumption that the pages were changed. If you sign your will and it's not stapled and it happens all the time, people don't listen, right? Uh, with word processing, I could reprint page two and make myself the beneficiary of your estate. So there are these just nuances that are very important. Um, so it's signed in the presence of two witnesses and if possible, in the presence of a notary. Notary is not required for a valid will. You could handwrite your will and you could sign it with two witnesses present. Again, you know, the presumption of regularity is not there. It will take your estate a little bit longer to pass through the courts at the time, but um, you know, it, it can get done. So as I was saying, notary is not required. If you do not get your will notarized when you execute it, we will need to locate those witnesses upon your death and get a notarized signature of those witnesses uh, at death. A will is only a piece of paper until you die and the court validates it. A will has to be filed with the court to be validated. That process is called probate. The process of probate is ordinarily pretty simple, but with an attorney drafted will, if all the family members are on board and everybody you know, knows where all the family members are. If we have a Holocaust survivor case, those cases are more difficult. Those will probates take longer. They cost more. Um, in cases like that, sometimes we will do a revocable living trust, which avoids the court altogether. If you don't need to do a trust, don't, because they cost more to do up front. And you have to change the title of all of your assets into a trust, into the trust. So your bank account will now read the Brian Rafan Trust as opposed to Brian Rafan individually. And incidentally, at Mutual Redevelopment, you cannot put your apartment into trust ownership. So if you do a trust at, at living at Mutual Redevelopment thinking you're avoiding probate, you're not because we still need to do probate for your apartment. The, the, it, it, HPD does not allow trust ownership of uh, cooperative apartments at, at Mutual. So I, I, yeah. a, a couple of questions again related to that. Um, someone is asking, can you cross out or change something in a will and then initial and date it? Would that be acceptable or would you have to redo the will? Yeah, it's a good technical question. It's totally acceptable if it's done before you sign, before you execute your will. Once you execute your will, if there are any handwritten edits, changes, cross outs, deletions, um, you've caused a significant problem. Now the court, when you die, is going to want affidavits explaining why those were done, who did them, when they were done, and, and, and why the will just wasn't redone. So the answer is, if you do it before you execute the will, you can, but it, you need to make clear it was done before. You cannot make changes. The only way to make changes to a will after it is executed and that process is the you sign and each witness signs, it's done, the book is sealed. The only way to make changes at that point is by executing a new will or a codicil, which is an amendment to a will. If you, uh, incidentally, when you die for a will in ordinary course to, to be probated, it needs to be the original document. We can't probate a copy with ease. We can do it, it'll cost you a lot of money because We'll have to have a hearing explaining to the court what happened to the original. The presumption in law in the state of New York is if the original is not found upon your death, it's presumed to have been revoked. So we need to overcome that presumption. So uh, in an easiest example to explain, we had a client who had her will in the vault at World Trade Center. The Trade Center came down. We couldn't access it. So we got affidavits and testimony that yes, Sadie told me she kept her will in the vault at, at the Trade Center. So we were easily able to explain why it was not there. But we have a case right now where we just don't know where the original is. Well, that original, the presumption is it's revoked. So that person is gonna die intestate and 
her um, nieces and nephews who did not speak to her are now going to inherit about a million point, uh, a million eight, you know? So, you know, you're playing with fire to do all these things on your own. So, but you can uh, change a will after, by just doing a new will. That's the simplest way. Brian, some more questions about codicils and making changes to your will. Um, does it have to be in a certain format? Um, does it also need to be notarized? And there's some questions, and I, I think you addressed this, but in terms of filing it, I think I heard you say, really, it's just about keeping copies with your executor until, in fact, you passed, and it has to be probated. If you, but questions yeah. about does it have to be filed anywhere prior to that? Right. So a codicil needs to be executed with the same statutory formalities as a will signed by you in the presence of two witnesses, um, you know, who all do this in a simultaneous wills execution uh, ceremony. Incidentally, if you do do it on your own, and again, don't, you know, don't have anyone else in the room because if there are other people in the room, there could be a presumption that somebody's influencing you to do your will in some fashion that you would not want. Certainly you don't have other beneficiaries in the room. So the, uh, the formalities are what they are, whether it's for a will or a codicil. Um, when we execute wills, we often hold the originals uh, and give the copies uh, by physical copy to the client. We also email them copies so they have it on their phone. They could send it to whoever they want. You, you can file a will with the surrogates court of New York County, where you all live in New York County, for safekeeping. They don't like it. Um, there's a, a fee to do it. Um, and, and it's not always a good idea to do for the technical reason that, for example, if you name your brother in a will and you file it in New York County and then you do a subsequent will and you give everything to your son, let's say, now your brother has standing to object in your, in, in your estate proceeding because you filed a will that has his name in it. So, you know, it gets a little technical, but um, they don't ordinarily get filed. What happens is the people in your, in your group, someone needs to reach out to your executor. You know, we're, we're constant, we get calls from neighbors, friends, building management, you know, someone who, who knows we're involved. We check in with clients. So sometimes we know if they're sick and we know it's, when it's coming. Um, you know, so there is no filing registry for that. Um, someone would like to know the general cost of a, a simple will with, with basically the asset simply being the Penn South apartment and everything in it. Yeah, ordinary will, a few hundred dollars typically. And a will could be any, start at like 350 for a basic will. I give everything to my brother. Um, you know, we usually have an initial conference with Zoom or something like this. And we spend a half hour or so talking about it. And, and we, would e we email over drafts. You read the draft, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll make uh, corrections if we make the spelling is wrong, one, maybe someone's name is wrong. And then we have a meeting in our office to review and execute. And, and we'll, we'll discuss in a minute how we were, we're executing these days. If, you know, sometimes we'll send those drafts to a client. And they say, you know what, I want to give out these 35 different items to these 35 people. Well, they've changed the plan. That's no longer, you know, $350, $400. Our, our fees are commensurate with the project that you give us. So we like to do things on a fixed fee that we all agree in, the, in advance. If you change the project, we will we'll change the fee to be reasonable. If you don't know what you want to do, we could try to help you gel your thoughts. Um. Question, do the names in the will have to match exactly with the birth certificate and or the passport? It's a good question, uh, no. Um, generally, there's no dispute. If, if there is a dispute, we have a, a large estate now where, they're, where the decedent client got someone's name entirely wrong. So, um, you know, if we really wanted, if, if there was someone complaining, we could ask the court to construe the will and, and revise the will. But generally, the executor uh, makes a decision and, and papers that decision sufficiently where it would not be an issue. If the name is, if, if you have two different, if you call some, you know, Stephen Smith and the person's name is, um, you know, Sean McGillicuddy, that's a problem. 
but you know, if it's close enough and you know, if you say my, my niece Joan and you only have one niece, but the name's not Joan, it's Jane, it's not a problem. Now, if there's a will contest, it may go to capacity. Maybe the person didn't have capacity because they didn't know the niece's name, but that's a different issue. Okay. And somebody asking, is there a way to leave the apartment equity and the bank accounts to someone without a will? And in addition to that, people were explaining that they have their children or others named as beneficiaries on their bank accounts or their um, IRAs and other, uh, other accounts. Is that, is that enough, as it were, to ensure yeah. that those resources go there? That's a great question. Um, those are what's called non-probate assets. Any asset that has a beneficiary on it or a co-owner pass outside the so terms. If of your will. will gives everything to me, but you have everything joint with your um, children or uh, in trust for your children or beneficiary for your children, those assets will go directly to your children, no matter what the will says. With regard to retirement accounts, you should always have beneficiaries on those accounts unless a specific decision is made with your accountant or lawyer not to. There's um, real tax implications to not having a beneficiary on a retirement account. As far as other accounts, if you want, you can name beneficiaries, but you have to understand the implications. If you have three children and you name them all as beneficiaries, let's say it's $30,000 in the account and you name three children. And of course, you know, you have some grandchildren and one of those children predecease you, your account will then be divided amongst the two children. And maybe you wanted it to go to your grandchildren in some fashion or vice versa, you know? So uh, it's very easy for a banker to say, put a beneficiary on an account, but you need to understand the implications of what that beneficiary designation means. If you're naming beneficiaries on an account, you could typically name a primary beneficiary and a secondary or contingent beneficiary. The bankers half the time don't understand those designations. Um, so, you know, you can do it, understand what it means, understand the estate tax implications of what it means, understand the in income tax implications. You have to have a probated estate anyway, because your co-op, you cannot name a beneficiary. You will definitely need to get your co-op equity through a court proceeding, and that's either a probate proceeding with a will, or if you die without a will, it's called an administration proceeding. Um, so, uh, you know, you can't, you can't avoid probate. You can't avoid it with a trust either at Mutual Redevelopment. Um, and I think last question really related to wills is where is the best place to keep the original will? Well, it's certainly not in a spot where nobody will find it. Don't be that good in hiding it. When we do wills and we keep the originals, we stamp the copies that we circulate that we have the originals in our safeguarded possession. You know, if you're taking the original we have had situations where we couldn't find the originals and we don't know what happened to them. We don't think they were revoked. Maybe a, a disinherited um, family member took the original and destroyed it because they were disinherited. And now without a will, they inherit, you know, so you got to be careful of that. Don't keep it in your safe deposit box because if you die, you're, uh, no one may have access to your safe deposit box and, it, and, and no one may even know about your safe deposit box for six months. So, you know, keep it uh, around in your apartment amongst your personal papers where your executor is going to find it. The question often comes up, who should you give copies to? You might not, you might want to give, if you're giving everything to your children equally, you can give copies to your children. If you're not giving it to your children equally or, or you're um, giving it some, something to someone who wants more, you might not want to give them a copy. The, I, I've gotten calls from people's family while the client's alive why did so-and-so only give me $10,000? They're calling me, asking me this question. You know, why are they calling me? That, you know, so be careful who you give it to. You might get, find yourself in a conversation that you might not want to have. Okay. And then uh, a lot of individual questions or per questions that pertain to people's, people's, excuse me, particular situations. So I'm not going to go into those, but um, 
a question about what happens to wills if the law firm that has done them goes out of business? Well, it's a good question. They're still valid. Um, the wills are valid. If, if I should predecease you, we have a number of lawyers at the firm who will continue to be there on, on this Zoom. We have Matthew um, Rafan and we have Samantha Benadiba, two of our lawyers, um, and, and they would just continue. You know, we have had situations where we have been unable to locate originals from solo practitioner lawyers. We have additional lawyers as well in the office. We have Matthew Carmody, who's not on the call uh, on the Zoom, and we have Michelle Yu, who is also not on the Zoom. We have a few paralegals, Sean Alexander and Tamisha Roberts and Alana. Uh, so, you know, we have a staff of 11. So but if, if, the, if the lawyer goes out of business and no one knows what he or she did with their vault of wills, it, you know, you could have a problem. All righty. I think that really wraps up most of the wills questions. So if you wanted to move on. Yeah, I'm just going to talk very briefly about Medicaid and one of the recent significant changes about Medicaid. And then we'll talk about some COVID changes. So, you know, a lot of our work is done with keeping people home. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, people run out of money, so they can't necessarily afford to stay home when they need home care. So New York State has a federal state program called Medicaid. Medicaid is a payer of last resort. They pay for nursing home stays when people run out of money, and they pay for community-based home care or home care workers that you see. I'm not going to really talk much about nursing home Medicaid, except say that when you um, apply for nursing home Medicaid, you have to submit five years worth of historical financial documents to show to Medicaid that you haven't given away all of your money, to th that you really are genuinely poor, that you haven't made yourself poor for purposes of Medicaid eligibility. Just because you're allowed to give money away for gift purposes doesn't mean you're allowed to give money away for Medicaid nursing home purposes. Of course, if you have a spouse, New York still has something called um, spouse or refusal. So if you have a husband and wife at home and the, the wife needs to go into a nursing home, the simple plan, and we do it every day, is we strategize a mechanism whereby we transfer everything from the wife's name to the husband's name. The husband who's staying in the community maintains all the assets. We make a, a Medicaid application stating that the wife no longer has assets and we submit a spouse or refusal and we will get free nursing home care for the wife and the husband will retain all of those assets. Medicaid will most likely make a claim against that um, community husband and we typically settle that claim for a reasonable sum. Um, uh, you know, we end up paying them some very reduced sum and they come once, we give them one check and we never hear from them again. But more importantly is home care. How do we keep you home when you're running out of money and you need care? For community Medicaid right now, if you have a million dollars and you give it away today, we can get you free Medicaid tomorrow. You can give it to anyone. You can give it to your better, to your children, to your spouse, to, you, to, to your family. We can get you free home care tomorrow. There's no look back period or prohibition for transfers. It's a great plan, it's a great mechanism. It takes 60 to 90 days and we have free home care in your house. It's a three-step process essentially. First, we make you Medicaid eligible. You figure out who you wanna give your money to, whether you're giving it to your children directly or whether we're forming a trust for you to hold the money. You put one of your family members in charge of the, of the trust for you. We make you financially eligible and we get you Medicaid approved. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Then there'll be an interview of you in your home to make sure you need home care. And most people find some need for home care. That's pretty straightforward also. The third step, which is really where we have the most difficulty, is how many hours of home care you need. If you, need six, if you want six hours a day or four hours a day, you know, a few days a week, that's easy to get and we can get you free care any, any day of the week. But the cases where we need seven days a week, 24 hours a day are more difficult. The way it's determined how much care presently you get is um, a nurse comes over 
to your house and interviews you. They plug in your data into their laptop computer and the laptop computer spits out, okay, six hours a day, seven days a week. You know, sometimes that's not enough for us. Um, we can schedule more than one of those interviews. You know, we talk to, to you or your family representative in advance about things to say, about things not to say. But um, the most important thing that I want to tell you about that community Medicaid, which is a, a great resource, is there's a significant change that just happened in the past three weeks or so. Starting October 1st, there's no longer the ability to give your money away today and tomorrow get free home care. It's now going to be a two and a half year look back period for community Medicaid. Now we'll still have spouse or refusal, so you can still give it to your spouse and get community Medicaid. But if you're on the verge of applying for community Medicaid, now is the time to do it because now you can, and you, and you need to give money away, now is the time to do it. If you truly don't have money, then we can do it at any point in time. To be financially eligible for <clears throat> community Medicaid, you have to have less than $15,750 in your name. In addition, you're allowed to have your retirement accounts in your name as long as they're paying out required, required minimum distributions to you. So you could have a million dollar IRA and you can keep that, that's not a problem. So, um, you know, Medicaid has some big changes down the road. Um, we'll, we'll, we're happy to talk to you more about that at a different time. It's not as COVID driven as some of these other issues that um, are out there, particularly advanced directives and wills, which I really, encourage you to think about and talk about you know it's funny everybody procrastinates with their wills all these people that have been procrastinating with their wills with us for the past year sometimes two years you know we try to nudge them now they're, they're calling us well i want to get it done yesterday you know it's, it's it's so it's so obvious just do it you know just do it so any questions before i tell you about a couple of covid uh changes going on uh, just one question. What what would be the cost if someone was seeking your assistance to help with the Medicaid application? Yeah, well, um, it, it depends. I, I imagine we're talking about a community Medicaid application. There are a few steps involved. We typically charge a fixed fee of $5,500, which includes a few things. It includes some of the documents we discussed, um, you know, power of attorney, it includes a, a statutory gift rider to a power of attorney, which is something we didn't discuss, but it's necessary when you do Medicaid. Um, we, we would visit your healthcare proxy, your living will, you know, it, it's, it includes that as well. Um, it, it includes a pool trust. If you're to, to be eligible for Medicaid, you have to have income of less than a certain threshold. I'm just going to round and say $900. If you have more than $900 a month in income, you're not Medicaid eligible. We need to make you Medicaid eligible. So what we do is we get you um, to join a pooled income trust. A pooled income trust is a not-for-profit organization that um, has um, been approved by the state to receive your excess income over the $900. We, we remit it to them each month and then they will use that income to pay your bills so um, from, from that income. Uh, so it's just really a fiction, uh, but it's a, a hoop we have to jump through to get you Medicaid eligible. So we would do the pooled income trust, we would do the Medicaid application, we would need to see what all of your assets are to strategize how to transfer those assets and who you wanna transfer them to if you want to transfer them to a trust, we could talk to you about trust planning. The cost of a trust is dependent on what you want to do with your trust. Um, um, and, and then, you know, we would get into scheduling those meetings. We, we would not appear at those meetings for you, um, but at, the meetings would be at your house with a nurse. Um, you know, they are still taking community Medicaid applications. Um, we have, we've, at first we thought they were going to be sort of a grinding at a halt. It looks like they're being a little more lenient now with, with a few of them that we've had go through. Um, uh, so, you know, that's so $5,500 is the answer. We can't guarantee how many, at, we can, we'll know if you can, we can get you approved for Medicaid. That's a black and white, but we can't guarantee how many hours of service we can get you. It's driven largely by your condition 
um, and your situation. Um, you know, we sometimes have to do two or three interviews with different companies to see who's going to offer the, the most amount of hours to, to you for home care. Sometimes what we'll do is if, if one company is offering, let's say they're only offering eight hours a day, seven days a week, um, you know, we'll take it and then maybe we'll file for a fair hearing uh, or request additional coverage at a later time. But it's just getting more difficult and more difficult to get 24 hour coverage seven days a week because the money's not there uh, in the budget. And who knows what, what, what the COVID expenses are gonna do to that in the long term. Great. Any other questions on that? Um, just one question I know that came up earlier. Um, it's uh, again here, if, if someone is leaving everything to their spouse, will that spouse have to pay inheritance tax? Um, so New York, um, estate tax threshold is north of $5 million. The federal threshold is north of $11 million, closer to $12 million. That's per person. Um, the federal threshold is coming back down to north of $5 million in, um, 2026. That said, you can leave an unlimited amount to your spouse without triggering an estate tax. So there's never estate taxes between spouses. Estate tax in the state of New York only kicks in for bequests or money passing to someone other than a spouse. So no is the answer. Okay. okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I wanna tell you about um, you know, two significant changes by legislative uh, executive orders of Cuomo related to execution of documents that impact our world. One, we've all had documents notarized before. I can't imagine anyone on this Zoom has not had something notarized. You go to the drugstore, you, you know, show them your ID, you give the guy $3 or whatever it is, and, um, and they notarize your document. You stand in front of him and he does it. Well, we no longer have to do that. We now have the ability to notarize for you via Zoom, via video. Could be Zoom, could be FaceTime, could be some other video. Um, the way it works is um, you have the document in front of you. Um, and if it's coming from our office, like power of attorney, we transmit it to you, you review it. You have the document in front of you. We have a live Zoom conference going on. It has to be live. We have to be able to interact with each other. Um, it's not like now you have me as the spotlight. We would need to be able to see each other and, and communicate with each other. Um, and and we, uh, you sign the document. Ideally, you have a third, uh, a third person or another person with you who's standing a few feet away videoing the document and, and videoing you so I could see you sign. But if not, it's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it like this. I'm going to say I'm going to sign this power of attorney. I sign. Okay, there, oh, there's my camera. Okay, I, I signed, there it is. That's it. I take the document, the entire document, and I, and I email it, fax it, scan it to the notary. You have to, fax, you have to get it to the notary the same day. So if you do it at 11 p.m., it ha you have an hour to get it to the notary. If you do it at 8 a.m., you have a lot of hours to get it to the notary. And then when the notary receives it, the notary will notarize, we will notarize the electronic copy we got, and we will send you back an electronic notarized copy. Um, you also, within 30 days, would get us the original document, either mail it or drop it off, as the case may be. I've had some situations where, you know, I'm in the city from time to time and I drive around and I pick it up from the doorman or something and, and you know, take it and notarize it. And, and, and we would notarize again on the original document when we get it. That's our practice. The, the statute doesn't even require that we sign on the original document and send it back to you or on the copy and send it back to you, but that's really the best practice. So now again, to review, if you have something you wanna get notarized, we do a Zoom. Um, we watch you sign the document, okay? If I don't know you or, or Samantha or Matt, we don't know you, you have to show us ID, but probably we'll know you by then, right? Um, and then you have to transmit the document to us. That's the challenge. How are you gonna transmit the document to us? If, if you don't know about it, if you have an iPhone, 
and you uh, you know the the memo app it's this little yellow notepad i'm uh, sorry the notepad app it's this little yellow notepad thing i'm going to show you what it looks like this this one on the top that on the top line that yellow notepad if you open it and you click to create a new item there's everyone has a scanner on their phone you could scan in from your phone so you open a new note new note right there you see that camera looking thing that camera thing is the scanner so you click it and it's self-explanatory and then you could scan it to us and then we would notarize it and you're done pretty pretty amazing pretty simple super helpful we've been using it a lot um, when you scan to us you have to scan the whole document not just the single page so um, that's the notary now, uh, a couple, can I um, interject with a couple of questions there, sure. Ryan? Um, you can do this. Can anyone who is a notary notarize by video? As so, anyone who is a state notary could do this video process. Yeah, we tried to get Cuomo to do this just for us, but he said no. So he made it for every notary. Gotcha. So this is not and, for us. any notary can do this, assuming they know what they're doing. And can can the notary still charge in this situation? Yeah, th there's nothing in the in the legislative um, uh, order, executive order, that says anything about charging or, or not. I mean, you know, so I, I don't know how those drugstores or whoever those charging notaries are doing what they're charging. I'm sure they're charging. I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, um, and and then a week or so after the notary uh, legislation came down. Cuomo made another great step. Uh, Brian, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have someone pointing out that they have a they have an app on their phone that claims that it notarizes. Is that acceptable or easier? No, not in the state of New York. Um, I'm unaware of it. I can't imagine that. Um, the, the, the executive order is really what it says is executive order. You got to be careful with apps like that. You could be scanning up valuable documents. You don't know what you're scanning up if you're scanning up a child's attorney. Um, if you scan up a strange app, could you imagine if they get an electronic version of your power of attorney and now change their name to the appointee and now they have access to your accounts? I'm not sure I'm loving that idea. So um, be careful. I don't know anything about that. Okay. So um, a, a, a week after or so, the notary, an executive order came down with regarding witnessing of documents like wills so now we could witness execution of wills via zoom it's similar to the notary process and the way we're doing it is of course we would transmit the document to you after back and forth we make sure it's the right document we would mail you um, a hard copy document or a pdf of a document um, we would also send you detailed instructions, such as if we're emailing it to you, the document has to be um, printed, stapled, you know, um, with the ordinary requirements. Um, if you have a, a, a disinterested third party who could video all this so we can interact directly, that would be great and helpful because it's tough to hold the iPhone and sign at the same time. So it's always best if you have a camera person cameraman, camerawoman uh, around, that's always helpful. So um, you have the will in front of you. Same story. Okay, I'm signing my will now. Signing. Okay, you ask the witnesses to be witnesses. You email the signature page to the witnesses. Let's say Samantha and myself are the witnesses. You, you email, fax, scan us the signature pages. Again, like the other procedure, we sign them and voila, it's complete. You don't have to send the complete document when it comes to witnessing, unlike on the power of attorney, the complete document has to be sent. That's important for wills because with wills, remember, once those staples are in, they should never be taken out. If they're taken out, the court gets nervous that pages were um, swapped out or changed. So um, you just fold it back and you take a picture or a scan of that one page. It's tough to put through the fax machine. You probably have to use a scanning app for that. 
and you scan the signature page. Again, it has to be done the same day and, and sent, and the will's valid. And then um, it's done, the will is valid. In our office, when, when, when we're free again and we're able to go back to old times, we're telling everyone, come back in and let's re-sign the same document with the ordinary protocols later. The goal is, is we don't wanna have problems after the fact, after death. When a lawyer says there's gonna be problems, that means you're paying for it. So the goal is to, to make your will as perfect as possible. So if we're gonna do one of these wills now, our goal is to correct them, not correct them, is to re-execute them later and get it done right. Now there's, there's more tweaks and details, and if it comes to, to, to doing one of these with you, we'll go through more tweaks and details, but this is generally the process. We're also um, doing self-executions where you don't need us as witnesses, you have two neighbors that will be witnesses. And um, the way that's ordinarily done is, let's say, you know, you have the documents, you've followed all the instructions that we send and it's ready, you have the two witnesses um, at your front door, um, or they've come in, you're six foot, you're socially distanced within the apartment, you're at the dining room table, everyone has their own pen in their hand and everyone is socially distanced. You sign, you ask the witnesses to sign, you step away from the table and they take turns approaching the table and they see each other sign and they see you and they've seen you sign. And, and that also works out fine. Um, the notary not required to make the will valid. The will is valid the minute it's signed. Um, if you have a notary there, that's fine, that's great. The remote notary is difficult because you have to send a complete document. If you want to do it, we can do it. But again, in our perfect world, we're gonna recommend that you come back in and re-execute the document under ordinary protocol later. Our office is on 7th Avenue and 30th Street. Um, it's pretty easy, you know, um, it, it's in your interest to come in, re-execute. It's always, it's always good for us to put a face, to, uh, uh, you know, a handshake. Could you believe it what it's like to hand, shake someone's hand? Forgot how that works. Um, you know, and you'll be in and out in 30 minutes and, and we're going into the springtime. So there's not many excuses for, for us not doing that. So. Um, Brian, we have a question. Is it best to have a pour over will? I don't know what that is. Well, a pour over will is a will, but it has a specific purpose. It's only used when you have a trust agreement. So if I'm passing my entire estate from a trust rather than a will, and, and we're not really talking a lot about that because um, in the context of mutual, you know, you, you can't really pass your apartment, but a pour of a will is a will where the beneficiary is a trust. That's all a pour of a will is. So uh, a pour of a will only makes sense if you have a trust and if it works in your circumstance. Gotcha. Any other questions? Uh, other questions on that? Yeah, actually, I'm sorry, one more. How secure is Zoom for using or for sharing this personal information? I don't know if you know of, about that at this point. Well, you know, um, it, 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 I'm sure everyone's reading about the, the videos about Zoom and security. They constantly update. I would just say keep your software updated. You know, um, if you want, use, if you prefer to do it with FaceTime or some other mechanism, you know, we can accommodate any mechanism that you prefer. We haven't had any problems with Zoom, but that's, that is something that, um, uh, you know, you have to be aware of. You know, you're not transmitting so much financial data. It's really planning data. So, um, you know, you're not giving account numbers over Zoom and, uh, or things of that. And just, uh, it all, it all, anytime it's, it's worthwhile to mention, there are tons and tons of fraudsters out there. Social Security Administration will never call your house. So if you're getting a call from the Social Security Administration saying that they need some information from you, hang up immediately. They do not call your house. You could barely get them on the phone when you call them. So don't think they care too much and they're proactive in calling you. It's a fraud. Hang up. If, if it's important, they will find you. If you're concerned, tell them to call me and I'll vet it out for you. But don't take calls from Social Security. Don't take calls from anyone asking for any of your financial information. It's all a scam. And we've had clients lose hundreds of thousands of dollars 
We've had brilliant clients lose real money um, who, who uh, engineers, people who think they're really smart. The fraudsters are really, really good. If you don't know them, if you get an email saying your cousin needs money, your son needs money, it's all a fraud. Get on the phone and you dial the person that you know directly to, to you know, so Zoom is the least of the problem. Any other questions? A, a few more and then I think we're gonna have to start wrapping this up because Brian, we are so thankful for all of your time here. Um, but just a couple of things, someone asking, can a power of attorney make healthcare decisions as well as financial decisions or is that exclusively a role for the healthcare proxy? Yes, you're correct. That's exclusively a role for the healthcare proxy. Power mm -hmm. of attorney is only financial. Okay, um, a question about not understanding why you can't have a trust if you reside in Penn South. Can't you exclude the apartment from the trust? Yes, that's, that's accurate. You can have a trust, but you might not get the bang for your buck. If your purpose of doing the trust is to avoid probate entirely, that cannot happen. Because if your apartment is owned by you, you still will have to do a probate to um, dispose of your apartment. So you, you can have a trust if you live at Mutual, but you may not, you, you will not avoid probate because your apartment is still in uh, individual name. Gotcha. And then a lot of individual tax, or questions about tax implications. And I'm assuming those are probably better directed to an accountant or a tax attorney. Um, no, not necessarily, I'm happy to, Okay, so the question is, is there a tax implication with passing the apartment equity, securities, and cash to beneficiaries? Um, the general answer is no. Inheritances are tax-free to the recipient. Um, if you're passing a retirement account, um, that's a traditional retirement account that's gone into 401k or IRA or other retirement character, before it was taxed, when it comes out, whether it's to you right now or to your beneficiaries upon death, um, that withdrawal is subject to ordinary income tax rates. Um, the passing of securities, the passing of accounts via a will is not income to the recipient. It's not subject to income tax. If you're over the applicable estate tax threshold, as I've mentioned, north of $5 million, and um, in New York State and north of 11 million for federal purposes under the present laws to non-spouse, no tax to a spouse, then there would be an estate tax. So um, that, that doesn't um, impact most people because the estate tax thresholds are pretty high. Okay. And if money is needed to sustain the estate until settled, will this come from ITF bank accounts first? Well, no, it, 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 ITF bank accounts are bank accounts that have a beneficiary on them. It stands for uh, in trust for. Um, it, it, no, someone needs to figure out how to sustain those accounts. I mean, you know, the, the common charges may need to be paid. Um, there may be a spouse that needs ordinary maintenance. You know, that's one of the problems with ITF accounts. That money is the beneficiary's money. If you have an ITF account in trust for account or a joint account with someone and um, you did it so they pay for your funeral, the truth is, is there's no legal obligation for them to pay for your funeral. At best, it's a constructive trust, but it's, it's their money. You're beholden to them using it to pay your funeral. If they've changed their mind, they do not have to use it to pay for your funeral. So it's not always the best plan to use that beneficiary planning. Now, if it's, you know, if your entire state is going to your one child and that one child is the beneficiary, whether they pay from the ITF funds or from their own pocket, it doesn't matter. So, you know, you have to look at the whole situation. So actually, I think that that um, covers all of our questions. Brian, I want to thank you so much for this uh, amazing presentation. We're getting Lots of feedback and some silent, some silent clapping. I think we've been doing this on Zoom lately. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you so much. 
Um, for everyone in the chat box, I did put all of Brian's contact information. Um, so uh, the location of his office, his, the phone number, and his staff is still answering the phone, as well as the website um, for uh, Rafan Law, so that everyone who I know is uh, interested in contacting him can do so. I just added um, my. Oh, I did it. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna plop up my email address, and in response, we will be answering um, questions today at no charge for everybody, and you'll get an answer from either myself or Samantha or Matthew. So, but I am putting up my email address. You could direct your inquiries to me, and you'll get a response from one of us. Uh, I hope uh, that helps you all. Wonderful, Brian. Thank you so much. That's extremely, extremely generous. Okay, everybody, stay safe, wash your hands. Absolutely, thank you again. Bye, Bye. everybody, thanks for attending. Sure.